Praise the Lord, church. Hallelujah. You are dismissed. We came. God showed up. He's moved. Woo! Hallelujah. What else is there? All I could do is just mess it up from here on out. God has moved into this house. Hallelujah. Glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated tonight. I was talking to a dear brother on the phone today, and he uh, called me up, asked me if I was going to stiff him for lunch again this week. Seems that's what's going on recently. And I said, oh, brother. Started singing the blues. It's like, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I said, let me tell you what my day is like, brother. I get a text at 1145 in the hotel room in Texarkana saying that my boss's boss flew into one of your stores, and he's visiting in your stores right now. So I had a sleepless night. Then I wake up and find out that my boss is driving up through my stores tonight. I have a bunch of stores. Tomorrow, the owner of the company and the ex-CEO of Walmart are flying in to visit one of my stores. And he's like, wow, what a day. And I said, and I have to speak tonight. <laughs> I said, brother, I need prayer. <laughs> I need prayer. I need to be able to walk into this place and put the world behind. Can you Say amen. Sometimes it's like that, isn't it? Whew. The toils and troubles of this life until we cross over to the other side. Praise the Lord. But I'm glad to be here tonight, and I hope I have uh, heard from the Lord. I, I was watching a television program on TBN, and it was a Christian apologetics pastor, and he made a statement that stuck with me, and it caused me to start studying. And then Pastor Gaddy had asked me if I could speak this evening, and I said, Lord, I know I've heard a word from you because it's just stuck here, and I can't seem to get it out. And I've got to figure more out about what this man said. So tonight I want to, I'm going to talk to you for a little bit. If you like to take notes and if you like a lot of stuff, that's kind of what this is going to be like tonight. All right, it's one of those stuff lessons, and i got a lot of stuff. So I hope to keep it on track here. But the title of my Bible study, somewhat, to, so, so to speak, it kind of is. It's a little bit of everything. But I had to find a title for it because that's what we do, right? And the title of this one is, Everyone Has to Deal with This Jesus. Everyone has to deal with this Jesus. I'm going to steal a couple of lines from Bill O'Reilly's new book, but indulge me here. Jesus of Nazareth had no army. He had no wealth. He had no sword. He had no headquarters. He had none of the infrastructure needed to start a movement. He had no PR department. He had no agent. Well, probably except for his dad. I mean, his dad was probably pulling for him, right? But he really had no agent. He had no Twitter account. He had no Facebook. How did he ever do it, right? You know, yet this carpenter from some 2,000 years ago has become the most polarizing figure in world history. He's the basis of our Christian faith as we know it, but what you might not know is that he is recognized by almost every non-Christian religion in the world. Everybody has to deal with this Jesus. Now, some don't deal quite as well as others. Those of you that were up around the altar tonight that made a move when, when, when Pastor Larry asked you to come for prayer, you have figured out how to deal with this Jesus. You've recognized who he is and the fullness of his deity. But there's a lot of people in this world that have not had it so lucky. You know, my wife and I were driving up speaking tonight. I, I was kind of sharing with her what I was going to talk about. And when I started giving her some statistics, she goes, wow, we sometimes kind of live in a little Pentecostal bubble, right? Kind of us four and no more, or us kind of what now I say 24 million Pentecostals, but us 24 million and no more. Well, guess what? There's 7 billion people in the world. Billion people. 7 billion people in the world. And I know all of them know how to deal with this Jesus. So tonight we're going to take a quick look at some of of four or five of the most major religions in the world and how they have chose to deal with Jesus Christ. This might help you in some ways. I think every time I started to study this in the last couple weeks, I've I've got something different out of it. And I I kept thinking the Lord had me go in a different direction, but I've stayed true to what the Lord wanted me to share with you tonight. I think everybody's going to take something a little bit different away from this lesson. Jesus declared in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way the truth, the life, right? And no man comes to the Father except through me. 
The old King James said, by me, but I like the through me in the new kingdom. Nobody comes to the, it's like, you ain't getting to God unless you're coming through me. I could almost see a parent, right, saying somebody trying to take their kid. Well, you can get, you can get to my kid, but you don't come, come through me first, right? If you want to get there, you're coming through here. Jesus declared that. There are 5.8 billion religiously affilio, affiliated individuals in the world. 5.8 billion of the earth's population claim to belong to some type of religious theology or religious organization. That's a lot of people that claim to have some form of understanding of this life and the life to come. So here's the breakdown of kind of the global religious landscape that you're living in today, all right? There are 2.2 billion confessed Christians. There are 1.6 billion confessed Muslims. 1 billion Hindus, 500 million Buddhists, and 400 million people are about 6% of people that kind of just practice another religion, just smaller fractions of religions all over the world. About 14 million Jews and about 58 million people that are about less than 1% of the population that belong to some sects of kind of Mideastern religions. So the groups that we're going to look at tonight, the four or five groups that we're going to examine tonight, represent 3.5 billion of the world's population. We'll cover four major religions and kind of a movement, and we're going to cover and understand that this is how about half of the world's population deal with Jesus. All right? So get your notes out. Here we go. Fast and furious. The first one we're going to start with, is, and, and, and the biggest one, is, is, is Islam or the Muslim faith. And most of it, may, well, you may not know. Let me, let me not assume that you know. But it was founded by Muhammad in about year 610 B.C., all right? And just to encapsulate what happened, Muhammad claims to have had a visitation from the angel Gabriel who said that all of the idol worship that was going on in Mecca at the time was wrong and that there was only one God. Many of you may, not, you may know or may not know this, but the Muslims only believe there's one God. They are monotheists, all right? You've got to give them credit for that. They only believe in one God. But... So, so, so Muhammad took this revelation that he had, he went down and started preaching this new philosophy that he had, that, that all of the idols that they had created were wrong, and there was only one true God, and his name was revealed to him to be Allah, right? Now, when, when Muhammad went down into some of the temples after he started practicing his faith, he recognized that the people had not built all of these statues and all of these gods. And, and, and the story goes that he actually went into the, the shrines and destroyed all of the images of all of the idols, except one, which happened to be a statue of Mary and the baby Jesus. Muhammad believed that, uh, that he was a great man of God. He believed that Jesus Christ was a great prophet. And he believed in a lot of the things that the Jewish and Christian faith had taught up to that time. So Muslims believe that Jesus, according to the Holy Quran, is a wonderful, humble, general, generous messenger of God who came down to, and revealed God's word to his people, the people of Israel. Now, they don't believe that Jesus is God, nor do they believe that God ever chose to come down to earth in the form of a man to die for our sins or to purify us and forgive us. According to Islam, Jesus never died on the cross nor ever wanted to die on the cross, nor ever was born to die on the cross. They believe that Jesus was sentenced to death, and the people thought that he got executed. So the Holy Quran rejects the idea and claims that it's a false one, that Jesus ever died on the cross for anyone's sins. But he does have a place in the Muslim faith, and he is revered. There's a lot of things that they do believe. And I, and I think, as I, as I thought about this, I don't know how many of you have had an opportunity to witness to a Muslim lately, but guess what? There's 1.6 billion of them out there. There's a lot of people that need to know how to deal with Jesus Christ. So let's look at some of the things that they do understand. Because there are some common ground that you can have if God ever put you face to face with someone of the Muslim faith. That God opened a door and of an opportunity for you to witness to. The first thing is that they do believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. You can actually go into the Quran and read a portion of the scripture. And we don't go into it for time's sake tonight. I've got it here. But it's actually the encounter of, of Mary with the angel saying that you are going to have a child. You are going, and she, she makes the statement in the Quran, well, how can I have a child when I've not known a man? Very much recounting what, is, what we read in the Holy Scriptures. So the Muslim faith actually believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. They believe he was a prophet. They believe he was a wise teacher. They actually even believe that he was a miracle worker. You can find a piece of Scripture, and I've got it here in the Holy Quran, that actually states 
where he said, I came to heal the lame, I came to heal the dumb, I came to heal the leper. They believed that he had, and Muhammad taught, that Jesus had miracle working power that came from God. They believe that he, he should be held in very high regard. They believe that Jesus actually ascended to heaven in a bodily form. If you've ever studied the, 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 the Islam faith, you read that later in Prophet Muhammad's life, he actually, some say it happened in a bodily form, some say it was more of a spiritual journey or a spiritual vision, but that he mounted an animal in Mecca and instantly was translated 600 miles to Jerusalem to the Holy Mount. Or the, Mount, the Temple Mount, which causes a lot of the, the turmoil in Israel right now because that's one of the Muslim faith's three most holiest sites. Because they believe that from that place, then, then Muhammad ascended up into heaven, had a good conversation with God. While he was there going through the levels of heaven, he actually saw Jesus, one of the prophets up there with, with Moses and Abraham and some of the others. So they believe that Jesus was quite revered. They believe he was a prophet. They believe he was a wise man. They believe that he was born of a virgin. They believe that he actually performed miracles. They believe that he ascended into heaven, and they even believe that he's going to return again. But the difference between what we understand through the Holy Scriptures and what they understand is that Jesus is actually going to come back to correct you and I for being wrong. (laughs) So when he comes back to earth, he's going to say, hey, all of you Christians that were worshiping me as the one true God, you all got it wrong. I'm not a God. I was just a prophet. You should have been worshiping Allah, and you all need to repent. That's what they believe. But there's a lot of similarities. You can see where Muhammad brought a lot of the Christian faith into his philosophy when he started this religion about 1,400 years ago. So I, I, I started to title this message that everybody wants a piece of Jesus. Because it seemed like the more I studied, it looked like, well, this faith just wanted to take this portion of what they understood about Christ. And this faith over here, when they formed their religion, just wanted to take these two or three pieces about Christ and put it in. Because, you know, the one thing that they can't do is they can't seem to get away from dealing with him. They've got to find a place somewhere in their reality to put Jesus Christ because they just can't discount him. There's too much there when they study who he was and what he did. No matter what part of him they choose to receive, They can't push him completely out of the picture. Isn't that cool? I thought that was kind of cool when I started studying this. I thought, wow, I I actually didn't realize, even though I'd studied this a lot, that they really believed all of these things. If I walk up to a Muslim and if he's really practiced and learned that he believes that my Lord was born of a virgin, (laughs) that my Lord actually ascended into heaven, that my Lord is coming back again. He's a little disjointed in all the meanings of that. But that we actually share some commonality. We could walk up to each other, and I could start a witnessing conversation to a Muslim and say, you you believe that Jesus was born, right? He goes, oh, yeah. Of a virgin? Yes, the Holy Quran teaches that. And he was a prophet? I do. That he worked miracles? Absolutely. It's in the Quran. You believe that Jesus ascended off a plane? He did. I believe he's coming back, do you? That's what the Quran says. There's a lot of common ground that you could find there with someone of the Muslim faith to witness to them and help them better deal with this Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Turn your page. That's the end of page one. There's your notes. The second one I want to look at tonight, and this one may be a little bit different, but but I I really liked, I've studied this faith before just because it's a little more of a a more modern religion, but have you ever, anybody ever studied the Baha'i faith? Baha'i? Bahalalula was the guy that started it. I really like his real name better. I don't know why they shortened it. I belong to the Bahalalula tribe, you know. But this actually, this, this religious sect actually started over in Persia or in Iran about 1860, somewhere around there. And, and, and Bahalalula believed that he was one in a series of kind of prophets from God, that there were, throughout history, there have been men in certain times that continued to deliver the word of God for that particular time period, And he was convinced that he was one of them and that he was going to be the last one and that it was his opportunity and his time to deliver God's message to his generation. So really interesting. So here are some things that he took on. And this this blew me away. I thought, well, I could have put Peter up at the top of this. This is what Peter believed of Jesus. And it really kind of falls into play. But at the end, he really discounts a lot of this and it really gets muddied into his philosophy. Baha, Bahalula, well, I say that wrong, but uh, say that, Bahalula, that's just fun to say, Bahalula, just kind of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Jesus, he believes that Jesus came from God, 
The Baha'i faith describes Jesus as a manifestation of God and acknowledges that Jesus was sent by God. However, it does place Jesus along other messengers from God from other religious movements like Abraham and Muhammad and Buddha and Krishna. So he came from God for his generation, but in a long line of other uh, messengers. He also believes that he was born of a virgin. He also believed and taught that Jesus spoke from God. Believed Jesus was a wise teacher. Believed that Jesus actually had a divine and human nature. Actually believed in the divinity of God. God manifested in the flesh. And he taught that to his followers. He believed that Jesus was a miracle worker. And he also, and this kind of threw me, because I I thought I had studied this faith before back 20, 25 years ago when I first became a believer and did a lot of studies, a lot more studies of some of this than I had recently. But he actually believed that Jesus was crucified and resurrected as an atonement for sin. But then he also believes that Krishna and Buddha and a lot of others were all part of this same link, that if we kind of follow all of these together, all of this kind of link together for your generation that you live in will help get you to heaven. He said, at the end, he said, Know thou when the Son of Man, these are some of his writings, Know thou that when the Son of Man yielded up his breath to God, the whole creation wept with a great weeping. By sacrificing himself, however, a fresh capacity was infused into all created things. It evidences and as witnessed in all the peoples of the earth are now manifest before thee. The deepest wisdom which the sages have uttered, the profoundest learning which any man hath unfolded, the arts which the ablest hands have produced, the influence exerted by the most potent of rulers are but manifestations of the quickening power released by his transcendent, his all-persuasive, and resplendent spirit. It's a pretty good rap on my Lord, you know. And I read that, I thought, yeah, go, Bahalula. <laughs> you almost got it right there, right? If you just took that out, you'd be okay. If you'd have wiped out Krishna and wiped out you know, Muhammad and wiped out, you know, all the other ones, uh, he, he may have found the truth. But he didn't. He still couldn't figure out how to completely deal with Jesus Christ. Even though he agreed with a lot of these core fundamental things that you and I, like if we took that list, it's a pretty good list, isn't it, Robert? It's not a bad list, really, about who Jesus Christ really was. But in the end, he's disillusioned a lot of people by just watering down the truth. Just hasn't, couldn't figure out how to really deal with Jesus Christ. The Baha'i faith. So, take, so look it up if you'd, if you'd like to and give Bala Lula a read. You might enjoy some of the things that he said. Hallelujah. For time. All right, we'll keep right on rolling here. Everyone has to deal with Jesus, even the Hindus. Now, the Hindus represent about one billion people in the world. One billion people practice the Hindu religion. Now, the Hindu religion is a little bit tougher. We've talked about Islam, which was started by Muhammad in about 600 B.C. We've talked about the Baha'i faith, which was, I just got to say it again, was started by Baha'u'llah in about 1860. But we're now going to talk about the Hindu faith, and it's a little bit squishier, I guess, to kind of figure out where it started. I mean, the Hindu faith really, a lot of the practices go back to well before the time of Christ, 1,000 to 1,200 years before Christ came. Um, it's really, if you go back and study it, it's really hard to say it started here, um, but it kind of started there is kind of what, the, what they know. And there's a lot of diversity in the Hindu faith. There's a, a lot of different sects. I mean, I read a, one time that there's like over 400 different denominations of the Christian faith. I mean, different sects that have a little bit different spin on Christ. So, but there are equally that's about three times that of the Hindu faith where you could find little sects where they have a little bit different style of teaching or believe a little bit different way. But there's approximately all told about one billion practicing Christians, or Christian, one billion practicing Hindus in the world. Now, they don't go quite as deep as Muhammad. They don't go quite as deep as Bahalula. But the great thing about re- realizing that they recognize Christ is that this Religion really started a thousand years before Christ came on the scene. So they had a pretty good long while to kind of get their faith going and get their beliefs kind of set up. And then all of a sudden along comes this man named Jesus from Nazareth, a carpenter, you know, born in Bethlehem. And by the time he's done, the Hindu faith has to look, they're looking at him 
and going, how do we deal with this guy? I mean, there, there, there's too much good there. Because if you, if you study the Hindu faith and realizing that a lot of their views on kind of reaching a, a, a great, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, to kind of reach a, an elevated state or um, kind of a state of enlightenment, um, it's really kind of what you do, what you say, who you become. Not really what you are, what you started, but if you can become a great teacher, a great philosopher, be wise, live a great life, inspire others by great moral teachings, you can aspire to actually become a Hindu saint. And that's kind of the way they look at Jesus. They looked at his life. They looked at this man that came on the scene. They studied all of the scriptures and all of the writings, and they said, well, he was a good man. He was a righteous man. And what he taught and what he said really was about love and peace and joy. Um, he, he did a lot of good. He, he had a bunch of people follow him, and they spread that message of hope and love throughout the world, and a lot of people followed him. So he's a pretty good guy. We'll hook him up and make him a saint. So Jesus comes on the scene, and the Hindus have to find out a way to deal with him. So you know what they do? They make him a saint. Saint Jesus with a red dot right in the middle of his forehead. I'm sorry, now you're scarred for life, right? All of those pictures in your mind, you'll see Jesus with a little red dot. And that's not mocking the Hindu faith, but that's how they have decided to deal with this Jesus Christ. They took a couple of pieces here, they took a couple of pieces there. What would fit into what we already believe? Don't, don't change our way of thinking, Jesus. Don't revolutionize or radicalize what we've already set up. But we'll take this, and we'll take that, and we'll agree with this, and we'll give you a little place of prominence along all of our other saints. Says, I don't know, maybe not to offend, or maybe just to make ourselves feel good, or you know, maybe that we can interact with the Christian faith and go, no, 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 we, we like your Jesus. He was a good guy. Liked what he said, liked what he did, liked what he wrote, liked all the stories. Gave him a place of prominence. We, you know, we'll just, then let's just all move on. But obviously, if you walk into someone now, if you meet somebody of the Hindu faith, you have to be able to understand how they look at our Savior, right? You have to be able to recognize what they've done with this Jesus of Nazareth and how they have dissected his ministry, how they dissected his message, played it so that it would fit into their own little world. Bring them into a church house like tonight. Bring them into the first 15 minutes of an apostolic service. They may take Jesus off the shelf with everybody else and put him up a little bit higher. Hey, because none of the other Hindu saints are letting me feel what I feel in this temple that worships this Hindu saint Jesus in a little bit more radical way than we do. Understanding what they know, understanding how they deal with Jesus, not only can help you witness to them, I think it helps me understand. I, 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 one thing Brother Hart and I did in the last three weeks of studying this message is I've learned a little bit more about my God. I read some scriptures in the last few weeks as I was studying this, and they became a little more precious to me. I was starting to read the words of Jesus, especially in the book of John, where he really talked about believing in me is the way to everlasting life. And I'm thinking, well, the Hindus are looking for enlightenment. Boy, if they just read the teachings a little bit deeper, if they just search a little bit more, if they would just let the word of God reveal itself to them, they might put aside all these other saints and all these other practices and recognize that the words that Jesus was giving them would would allow them to reach the state that they're looking for, right? Everyone has to deal with this Jesus. Just how they do it kind of puts the squabosh on what they're going to get in the end, right? Buddhism. While Buddhism is, pri- pri- is based primarily on the teaching of Siddhartha Gautama, I'm not going to say that one again, all right? <laughs> He's a spiritual leader that lived about 563 to 483 B.C., and he is reverently known, as most of us would know him, as the Buddha, all right? The little man, the little guy, right? That you see when you go to eat Chinese dumplings and go to eat the Chinese restaurant, right? That's the little guy. That's the Buddha. You could walk up and maybe you could say it. You go, hey, there's a statue of Siddhartha Gautama. I don't know. Maybe it'd make you look smart, right? But Buddhism incorporates a variety of religious beliefs and practices. Like Hinduism, Buddhism provides no singular unified view about Jesus, although a number of Jesus' characteristics are described by many Buddhists in a real positive way. Got a half a million, or 500 million, or a half a billion practicing Buddhists in the world. Pretty good chance you might run into one. 
go to eat the Chinese restaurant. <laughs> you, may, you may find a Buddhist there. <laughs> All right? You don't ever know. But here are a couple of things that they believe about Jesus. They believe that Jesus was an enlightened man. All right? Most Buddhists acknowledge and respect the fact that Jesus lived a self-sacrificial life and he had compassion on those who were in spiritual need. This kind of compassion is seen by Buddhists to be the key to happiness and enlightenment. For this reason, many Buddhists refer to Jesus Christ as an enlightened man. They also confess that he was a very wise teacher. Most Buddhists also respect the teaching of Jesus to a very high degree, especially Jesus' teaching related to loving one, and one another's neighbors and the need to demonstrate kindness and forgiveness. His teaching related to compassion, for example, impressed the Dalai Lama extremely. Jesus is seen as someone who possessed the correct perspective of life, and his teachings helped others to embrace truths. Some Buddhists, including the 14th Dalai Lama, and I just threw this one in there because it's good, even recognize Jesus as a, yeah, I can't say this word, Buddha's Hatzva. I'll spell it now. You can look at my notes later if you'd like. But it's one who dedicates his life sacrificially to the service or the betterment of others. They believe that Jesus was actually a holy man. The, Dalai, the current Dalai Lama describes Jesus as a holy man. And, and in fact, the Dalai Lama does not typically elevate Buddha to a greater status than Jesus when discussing the two figures. And he puts Jesus right up there because of the life that he lived. Not necessarily the content of who he was, but the life that he lived and some of the things that he taught, they give him reverence. So the Buddhists have even had to find a way to deal with this Jesus. They've had to look at this great man who had great teaching and had great wisdom, and they had to find a place in what they already believed was the right way and put him somewhere because they can't just discard him. You can't live in this world and not have to deal with Jesus. Right? What does the Bible say? You know, you're, you're going you're to serve him here or you're going to kneel up there. But you're, one of these days, you're going to bow before him. And you're going to confess who he is, whether you want to call him a Hindu saint, whether you want to call him an enlightened one, whether you want to call him a holy man, whether you want to believe all the things he did but put him in line with all the other prophets, whether you want to believe that he was a secessionary prophet from God giving a word for a particular time and a particular generation. You're going to have to deal with the truth of who Jesus Christ is, either here or over there. A lot of you got it right tonight. Now, the last thing I want to look at, and, and this, this is a little, again, kind of a gray one, but, but kind of the New Age movement, right? Really, New Age movement and spiritualism and mysticism really started about the mid-1800s, and there's so many sects and varieties of this that, that we wouldn't dare to try to go into it. But, but, it's, but it's worth noting, because if you, you walk into a bookstore now and go to the New Age section, it's pretty vast. I think it was my wife even said that they were there. They were at the bookstore and they were looking for, I don't know, the Bible or they were doing something. They were over in that department. She's like, wow, this new age movement, you pull it out and it's got everything. And you know, it's mysticism and it's astrology and it's witchcraft. Just basically anything you want that's anti-God, they call it new age, right? And just stick it over there in a section in, in Barnes and Noble. And you can go over there and just enlighten yourself to the ends of the earth with all kinds of silly stuff. But the new age movement is really diverse. But perhaps the most striking, however, is the pluralism and relativism that exists within the movement. Any attempt to identify Jesus as the singular God of the universe will surely be rejected by anyone who is really into kind of New Age mysticism in the occult. Many New Age believers are willing to consider the teaching of Jesus. However, the Christhood of Jesus is often described as something that all of us could attain. In this sense, Jesus is seen as a man who completed a process of spiritual evolution over successive generations of reincarnation, becoming an enlightened master. So whatever you want to go to the Barnes & Noble section of the bookstore or under New Age and pull out and study and start to believe, before it's all over and done with, you're going to have to deal with this Jesus. <laughs> if you want to go dabble in witchcraft, you're going to be against Jesus. If you want to become an enlightened one, well, he's a good example, according to them, of how you can be reincarnated lifetime after lifetime after lifetime and eventually, maybe, get it right. <laughs> Reach a state of enlightenment. Everyone has to deal with Jesus. So, so why do we think that we, they have to give an account for him? Why is it that all of these major religions of the world, and these are non-Christian denominations, right? Now, 
I, I, we're, not, we're not talking about Christian scientists tonight because we understand Jesus would probably take a pretty prominent place or the Mormon faith. And I have a gentleman who works for me who's a good Mormon man, comes from a family of Mormons, second or third generation. We've had several inter- interesting discussions about the Book of Mormon over dinner about the fact that I, I, I never let him get back the, that past the fact that John Smith was sitting in the woods and saw God and Jesus. And I just keep saying, but it can't happen. <laughs> okay, we could talk about the rest of the book all you want, but until you convince me that I could sit in the woods and God and Jesus in a form that I could view could appear in front of me, I'm not going to believe the rest of your book. Because there's no other scripture that they gave to the children of Israel that apparently he gave to this tribe that lived in America that goes with all of the things that he taught to the children of Israel and it doesn't make sense and I can't listen to the rest of it until you convince me that a man can see God. Because I have scripture that says, no man has seen God. Moses saw his feet, got a little glimpse of him, heard him talk through a burning bush, been some manifestations that some people have encountered. My word, the word of God that I have read says no man can see God. When we get up to heaven, we still won't see him, but we'll see him in the form of Jesus Christ, right? So I haven't even talked about them tonight, okay? <laughs> we, if I get asked to speak again, maybe we'll go into that faith, because I have a, 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 been witnessing the Mormons my whole life. My wife and I had them at the door when we were first married. Hey, yeah, come on in, sit down. How many books of Mormon do you have? <laughs> let's break them out. Oh, hold on, let's go back. Let me pull up the thing on John Smith and how you actually became Mormons. Nope, can't get past two gods, you know? It's pretty easy. Once you, once you know the weakness, once you know where the fault lies, you can get in there. But so, so why do you think that all of these other non-Christian religions of the world have to make account for him? Let's kind of review real quick some of the things that we've talked about. Muslims believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he's to be revered and respected, and that he was a prophet, he was a wise teacher, who worked miracles and ascended to heaven and will come again. The Baha'i believe that Jesus came from God, was a wise teacher who had a divine and human nature, that he worked miracles, that he was crucified and resurrected as an atonement for humanity's sins. The Hindus believe that Jesus was a holy man, he was a wise teacher, and that he is a, small g, God in the Hindu sect. Buddhists believe that Jesus was an enlightened man and a wise teacher. New Age believers maintain that Jesus was a very wise and moral teacher. Even the disciples, when Jesus was still here, were having a hard time figuring out how to deal with just Jesus who they'd been following, right? So even the disciples, and I know this may sound a little harsh, had to, de- had to deal with Jesus, all right? Because until a certain time in their uh, discipleship with Christ, they didn't get it, did they, Brother Harden? They, they didn't get it. They couldn't see it. They knew they could see Jesus. They were following Jesus. They were watching the miracles. They were hearing the words. They knew that this was something great, but but they hadn't really put all the pieces pieces of the puzzle together even late in the ministry. In John, he finally told him, and he turned to him, he said, look, don't let your hearts be troubled. All right, I get that you don't know how to deal with me. (laughs) I get it that you don't. (laughs) So just chill out. Don't let your heart be troubled. Do you believe in me? You see me? You see the works I've done? Well, believe in my Father. Or believe it for my very work's sake that, that, that I am he. So, so he turns around and tells him, I know, I, 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 I'm God. So I know that you're having a hard time. I'm saying things that, that aren't registering. And I'm, I'm speaking words and I'm seeing you going, wow, that's what he said. I don't get it. You know, wow, that was really deep. So he tells him, don't let your heart be troubled. I'm going to go up a prayer place for you. And if I go away, I'm going to come again. And I got this great big house that we're all going to live in. It's a big, big house. With, I could break into it, right? With lots and lots of room. It's got a big, big table. <laughs> lots and lots of food. I'm still hip at 50. I got it. It's a big, big house. That's right. It's my father's house. Tom Salmon turned to him and said, hey, I don't, I, we're, we're not sure how to get there, God. We, we can't, still haven't figured this out. He said, don't worry, don't worry. In due time. In due time, you'll figure out how to deal with me and all the pieces of the puzzle will fitly join together and you'll understand what this thing's all about. John 3, 16. If you'll throw some scriptures up there for me, brother, because I didn't even write them down. I just wrote the things down. Let's listen to what Jesus said when he talked to him. He said, for God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him 
should not perish but have everlasting life. Next scripture. Throw them up there. Rapid fire. Keep them rolling. Next one. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he that does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Keep going. John was writing them down. He was on a roll talking about eternity. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. Keep going. Another verse in John. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Hallelujah. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Go on. John was on a roll here. And this is the will of him who has sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Keep going, there's a few more. John 6, 47. Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, that he that believes in me has everlasting... Jesus was on a roll here right now, wasn't he? He was trying to get these guys to understand, this is who I am. If you believe in me, and if you'll figure out how to deal with me, there's some promises that I can give you. He has everlasting life. Next scripture. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal upon him. Jesus was trying to get his disciples to understand, look at who I am. Figure out how to deal with me. Put this all into perspective, and if you'll accept it, and if you'll live it, everlasting life is yours. There's a few more down here. Keep going. John 6, 27. John, is that the one I just hit? John 12, 50 says, And I know that his command is everlasting life, Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Hey, I'm telling you the truth. The words I'm speaking came from my Father, my PR agent, the guy who's looking over me, the guy that's got this thing all set up. John 18, 35, when Jesus was standing in front of Pilate. Pilate turns to him and says, Thine own nation and chief priests have delivered thee unto me. Because why? Why? They don't know how to deal with you. (laughs) You have perplexed them for three and a half years. They don't know what else to do to you. They have given you to me. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate said to him, well, art thou a king then? Jesus said, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end, I was born, and for this cause, I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth, and that everyone that is of truth hears my voice. Hallelujah. Man, look at that, 802. That's pretty good. I wasn't even watching the clock. If you've not figured out how to deal with this Jesus Christ, if you've practiced the Hindu faith, if if you're a Buddhist here tonight, if you're a Hindu here tonight, If you're a Muslim here tonight, if you're practicing New Age mysticism tonight, I would challenge you to look at the one man that every religion has had to deal with. That's Jesus Christ. I would challenge you to take a hard look at his teachings. I'd challenge you to find a minister of the gospel within this congregation and say, I'd like to know more about how to deal with this man called Jesus Christ. Because no matter what I do, no matter what I've searched for, I keep coming back to him, and I can't get away from it, and I don't know how to deal with it, and I need peace. How many have dealt with Christ? How many figured out this Jesus and have figured out how to deal with him? How many have received him as your Savior? Aren't you glad that there was a time, hallelujah, and in your life, you had a revelation of who this Jesus truly was, and that you decided to let him deal with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Appreciate you tonight. Hope you've enjoyed the word of the Lord. Brother Larry, if you'd stand to your feet this evening. God bless you tonight.